Malatesta's Carnival of Blood is a 1973 horror film directed by Christopher Spieth and written by Werner Leipold. Leipold? Leopold? A lot of them's right. That's why you say it multiple times, so you get it right eventually. The film follows the Norris family, Vina, her father Frank, and her unnamed mother as they start their new jobs working at Malatesta's Carnival. We open on our protagonist getting her cards read by the carnival's fortune teller, Sonia. After being frightened by a slight breeze and Sonia being a bit too grabby, Vina leaves the fortune telling stand? Booth? Ah, eh, I don't know. Carnivals are before my time. Meanwhile, her parents are being shown around the very legitimate carnival by the extremely trustworthy Mr. Blood, a sort of middle manager for Malatesta. They run into each other, and after being chastised by Mr. Blood... Who's having my fortune told? A lot of nonsense, that. That's for old ladies. They line up. You should see them on a Sunday afternoon. Hundreds of them. Straight from church. And informed that her boyfriend, Johnny, is supposed to arrive at the carnival that night, Venus sent off to go set up prizes at the shooting gallery, which is run by her parents. And her too, I guess, technically. Sorta. Of. The Norris is on it, that's the point, that's the main takeaway here. While trying to work, she meets Kit, a man lacking looks and charisma. Kit complains about a lack of business, mentioning rumors that children have died at the carnival. Vina asks him, what do you want? And he replies with, What everybody wants. Money. Affection. But what I want is different from what I got. And with that, I already knew I wasn't going to like this guy. He invites Vina over to the Tunnel of Love, which he's in charge of, but their flirting sesh is interrupted by the appearance of another family that lives and works at Malatesta's carnival. Look at how this guy just grabs his kid. Just really yanking on those arms. I mean, yeah, sure, she's throwing a tantrum. But yeesh, dude. Cool it. Anyway, these are the Davises. Adele, Henry, and their daughter, Toby. Toby's throwing a bit of a fit because she wants a toy, but Mavina gives her one. Oh, well. <laughs> After rudely tossing some of the Norris's merchandise on the ground, Toby's spirited away to the Tunnel of Love by Kit. Get your mind out of the gutter, freaks and creeps. She's riding with her parents. Well, her mother. Her father's a bit too big to ride on the same boat as them, so he has to sit one behind. How embarrassing. After sending their boats into the tunnel of unhappy families, Kit leaves to go read, uh... I honestly can't tell what that is. Some sort of instruction manual, maybe? Whatever it is, he doesn't have much time to enjoy it, because after a few seconds, the Davis's boats make their way out of the tunnel. Except, this time, they're empty. Naturally. Kit goes looking for the family inside the tunnel. All he finds is Henry's glasses, now broken, and some blood. He washes his bloodied hand clean, though they say you can't really do that with blood, metaphorically speaking, and we cut to later on in the evening. Mr. Blood's visiting the Norrises at their trailer. While her parents are entertaining their guests, Vina's cooking dinner. Mr. Blood gets an invite to stay for dinner, but unfortunately, he's a vampire. I'm on a very strict diet. Oh, I don't believe it. You look pretty healthy to me, Mr. Blood. <laughs> <laughs> Discipline, Mrs. Norris. My metabolism is most unusual. So naturally, he has to decline. While Mr. Blood's being inconspicuous, Kit's sneaking up to the window so he can talk to Vina about the Davis' disappearance and explicit, if unseen, death. He asks her to meet him at the Ghoul's Eye, which only kinda sounds like a bar you'd find in the Fallout universe. After Mr. Blood takes his leave... We see this. Outside the Norris's trailer. We get a short scene of a carnival groundskeeper being suspicious and Malatesta. Alright, we don't know he's Malatesta at this point, but come on. Being creepy for a few more seconds. We're then introduced to these two guys, Lucky and Wynn. Unfortunately for Lucky, his name's ironic. Wynn asks Mr. Blood for assistance, since his friend just lost his head, which he of course doesn't get. Mr. Blood directs him towards the groundskeeper we saw a moment ago, resulting in the poor sop getting trepanned. 
We get a quick scene of another suspicious carny drinking rainwater, and we follow Wynne's body down some stairs, onto a pulley, into a... thing... and finally into the clutches of some hungry zombies. Fear the zombies already ate, I guess, and they're opting to sing instead of snack. Malatesta appears, frightening a zombie who was just living his undead life, and tears off a chunk of Wynne's chest, which he tosses to a few other zombies, and I guess he says this... Clean this filth away. We cut to a riveting scene of Vina's father playing solitaire and discussing Kit with Vina's mother. And then we see Sonia, who's getting an impromptu visit from Malatesta, who reminds her to hustle. Vina! You have come back! The cards have drawn you! There is work for you tonight, Sonia! Sonia stops Vina, who's on her way to the ghoul's eye. She asks Vina to come get her fortune read again, but Vina adamantly refuses, making her way to a rendezvous with Kit, who's doing this. When his concert's finished, he tells her there's something off about the carnival. They confide in each other that they both feel isolated and hunted here, and he tells her the nitty-gritty of what happened to the Davises. Then someone sneaks up on them. A brief chase ensues, but Kit makes the mistake of trying to climb an electric fence. He's fine, unfortunately, and he tells Vina to head home while he deals with the undead custodian. Kit outwits him, surprisingly, and at the Norris's trailer we learn that Johnny's going to be late. Oh no! We jump to the next day, where we see Irva Viches, who is an absolute snack in this movie, even if his character is, uh... Not fair! Bobo is not smart! Pity! Poor Bobo who does not sleep! Who does not have a brain like everyone! Like that. So Irvi's character, Bobo, threatens Vina with a gun. Her father comes out from the back of the... Stand? Gallery? Let's just say gallery. Sure. It's a shooting gallery. Vina tells her father about the interaction, and he's incredulous all around. What are you talking about? Well, he was just there. What's the matter with you? Nothing. There was a dwarf there. He was pointing a gun at me. He was going to shoot me. Well, don't you believe me? I tell you, there was a dwarf there. Why don't you go back to the trailer and lie down? I mean, man. A little person? At a carnival? And a BB gun? At a shooting gallery? I wouldn't believe her either. She leaves, but not to lie down in the trailer. Instead, she's got another hot date with Kit. She asks for an update about the Davises' hitherto undiscovered corpses, but learns that Mr. Blood's been skulking around all day. Did you find anything in the tunnel today? That's a good one. Blood's been around all day, either in the tunnel or out here watching his gold mine. They can't say much, however, before the non-vampire himself shows up. The Ferris wheel, two o'clock. He teases them a bit, then... To Vina's vague dismay, he mentions Johnny. That's really all he does before driving off. That pickle, Kit, my boy. You have a lot to learn. We get one of those dream sequences where it's not 100% clear what's a dream and what's reality. You know the ones. It's not bad, but I'm not really going to cover it. Because I think at least half of it's supposed to be symbolic. And we're not really doing symbolism right now. I'm just kind of giving you a rundown. From there, we cut to Malatesta's discount theater. Zombies only, and Bobo. Malatesta's got a good seat. Presumably, he's on a date with Bobo, since they're sitting right next to each other, away from the crowd. Vina very rudely walks in front of the screen, prompting the zombies to throw shit at her. Listen. This scene's pretty fucking out there. I'm summarizing it as best I can. To inject some normalcy, we cut to Vina's parents. Her alarm clock rings at 1.48 in the morning and her parents learn she's disappeared again. Her father decides to go looking for her. While running from Malatesta's discount theater, Vina pauses at the Ferris wheel and happens to see the stabbed body of Kit.
Her actress gives a good scream. And we find her collapsed on the ground, being expertly comforted by Malatesta and Mr. Blood. My dear, my dear, you are so upset. My dear, yes, it's too bad about poor, poor Kit. Don't be so upset, though. I know being jabbed in the back with a cane always cheers me up. She runs away from them, understandably, and while she's getting the hell out of Dodge, we're being tossed back into Dodge with her parents, who are confined in their trailer due to zombies. Vina makes it to a phone booth, and I honestly don't really understand what happens here. I think the operator can't hear her, or there's connection issues. The point is, nobody's coming to help her, but this is a horror movie, so we expected that. Her call's overheard by our original suspicious zombie, who chases her into, uh, this room, which was under the roller coaster, I guess. He grabs her ankle, but she grabs a convenient piece of wood and bashes him on the head. While he's writhing, she makes her way into, uh, this room and collapses. We get a Phantom of the Opera reference. And then we see Malatesta and Bobo surrounded by their zombie horde. Let's just pause and take a second to look at Herve Vichez's look of exhaustion. Poor guy deserved better than this. He deserved real roles with real characters, and not Bobo. Alright, so, Malatesta starts howling like a werewolf. <coughs> then he pulls out a discount trumpet. And that's over, and we're back at the trailer where Mrs. Norris is trying to call the cops, and Mr. Norris is shooting at nothing. Mrs. Norris seems pretty upset about the whole certain death by zombie horde thing, but not to worry, Mr. Norris has a plan. They can't seem to move very fast, those, those things out there. I've got a plan. We'll make a break for it, set the trailer on fire, and try to find Vina in the confusion. Naturally, she's not very happy with this, but they do it anyway. Meanwhile... Mr. Blood and Malatesta cart around Vina's unconscious body for a bit. Out of the theater, into the theater, into the spinny tunnel. All right, what are Mr. and Mrs. Norris up to now, those scamps? So they run from some zombies, get cornered, run down some stairs, then we see the smoldering remains of their trailer. Here, we're introduced to Johnny, who's told by Mr. Blood that the Norrises are dead. You just said something about this trail. It's theirs. The Norris's. Or was, I should say. Are they all right? Where are they? Oh, boy. I don't want you to take it hard. They're at rest, or we poor slobs have to struggle on through life. Johnny somehow got half the charisma and looks of Kit, making me miss the milk toast bastard. Kit, too, Electric Boogaloo, decides to investigate the trustworthy Mr. Blood and the very legit carnival. He heads to the office, where he finds a very normal book. Every office has one of these. It's just up to you to find it. Johnny's reading is interrupted by a carny offering him a job. He's handed another book, this one featuring names instead of pictures, and he recognizes the Norrises. Before he can ask too many questions, the subject gets changed. You like books. So you looking at my picture book. Look here, how they cut the feet off. The carney espouses the virtues of cannibalism, which scares Johnny off. They say that meat builds blood and flesh and gives you new life. Do you believe that? Yes, I guess so. So wouldn't it follow that a man could live longer and longer if he ate more of the same? After getting away from the long-lost Sawyer brother, he ends up at the merry-go-round, and we get another glimpse of Herve Vichez, looking fucking exhausted before going into a threatening rhyme. Berry, berry, not yet dead. Stupid Johnny, use your head. Johnny follows him down some stairs, and we briefly go to Malatesta's discount theater, where they're now playing The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Malatesta says this, Quasimoto. And then we finally see where Venus ended up. Mr. Blood creepily watches her for a minute before waking her up, playing the role of an innocent man who wants to help her. That's enough sleeping, Vina. You've got to get up. That's better. 
I've come to help you escape. As you can see, he's really good at it. It's Mr. Blood, Vena, dear. I've come to help you out of the frying pan. No, you're bad. <laughs> no, that's enough. You must be quiet. I want to help you escape. That's enough. I want to help you. You're evil. No, I'm not, Vina. You must believe me. He informs her that Johnny's here and offers to take her to him. Considering her options are A. Go with a suspicious old man or B. Lay down and wait for Malatesta to come I don't know. Force her to play Belle in his Beauty and the Beast fan film? She chooses option A. This turns out to be a no-win scenario as he leads her to the extraction room. I don't think it's called that, like, canonically. I just call that because that's the room where they take her blood out. Enough blood to make her pass out, apparently. Mr. Blood gives a quick present and downs some Kool-Aid with a little too much fervor. Oh. <sighs> Malatesta shows up, much to Mr. Blood's dismay, as he's not allowed to drink from anybody without Malatesta's permission. Anyway, he gets psychically tortured. No! Malatesta takes her body out of the extraction room, through the sewers, and right past where Johnny's hiding. Why the zombies don't notice him, I couldn't tell you. The young lovers are reunited after some struggling, and they decide to leave. Meanwhile, Mr. and Mrs. Norris are making their way through Malatesta's discount theater, but unfortunately, they didn't get the memo that it was zombies, and Bobo, only. Mrs. Norris is eaten, not in the fun way, and Mr. Norris exits, pursued by Horde. Somehow Vina and Johnny ended up on the roller coaster, along with <gasps> Mr. Blood? Hijinks ensue. Now Mr. Blood's dead, and Johnny tries to chase down Malatesta, only to be met with the old switcheroo. Malatesta, I'm coming after you! Back at the roller coaster, Vina's oh, gross. Vina's being comforted by Sonia, who's only marginally better at that than Mr. Blood. They smell the blood. <laughs> it is not safe here. You must follow me. Sonia tells Vina to trust her, which she, once again barely conscious, has no real choice but to do. We cut to Bobo, who doesn't like loud noises, I guess. Then we see Mr. Norris as he explores the shittiest hall of mirrors I've ever seen in a movie. He gets wasted, eaten, and we're on to Johnny again as he thinks he's finally found Malatesta. Fortunately, it's Bobo. Unfortunately, he gets hit with, uh, that before begging for mercy. Please, please. Wow, I finally understand why people are into French accents. While Johnny and I are both deeply distracted, someone sneaks up behind him. We go to Vina, who's being led through some back rooms by Sonia. She opens a door, revealing the corpses of Vina's parents. This is a normal thing to do when you see your parents' corpse. Sonia locks her in, shocker, and we see Malatesta talking to a cop. Mr. Malatesta, we have to check these things out. Of course. Their conversation's interrupted by Bobo. He leads them to Johnny, who's gagged in one of those, uh, those dunking games? I don't know what they're called. The officer sees nothing strange about the fact the person in front of him is gagged and not, you know, dressed like a clown and calling him a dipshit or whatever. And after a few tries, he wins, I guess. Ah! 
Below them, Vina hears their conversation in the makeshift morgue. We get a shot of the zombies being weird. Then we see Malatesta on that spinny death trap thing that I wasn't allowed to ride as a kid because there was a lot, of, a lot of people just flew right off him. Just dead. Kills you. Don't get on those. They're dangerous. Then we fade to credits. This was Spieth and Leopold's only film, which is a shame because it was a fun watch. I know I riffed the movie, but I did like it. And I would have loved to have seen other films from them, once they'd gotten their footing in regards to filmmaking, or if they'd brought on an experienced voice to help guide their ideas. If you're into watching goofy horror and making fun of it, or you like offbeat stuff that's a little rough around the edges, I recommend seeking this one out. Of course, it's apparently something of a cult classic, so you might have already seen it. At the time of recording this, it's free on Tubi and one ninety nine everywhere else, so you don't really have any excuse to not watch it if you want to. Also, I added the movie to Does the Dog Die, so if you need specific trigger warnings, check that out or feel free to ask me in the comments if this contains, you know, whatever might bug you. Until next time, thank you for watching, and good night.